highlight of Karen Fellow. And I will, be, I will be presenting today's Morbidity and Mortality Conference, entitled Just Waiting for a Miracle. So the objectives for this hour is that the learners will be able to recognize the benefits of initiating a palliative care consult early in a patient's disease course, and not just at you know zero hour. Um, and then to understand the importance of an interdisciplinary team approach in patient management. And then also to develop strategies to improve communication, not just between the interdisciplinary teams, but also with the family members of the patient. So why did I choose this particular case? As we'll go through, you'll see, it was never a case where one big thing happened that was maybe malpractice-like, but it left me feeling like we could have done better. We could have done something different, and maybe it would have been easier for not just the patient and the family, but also the teams, because this case took a toll on everybody who was involved. So I'd like to introduce our patient, Mr. V. He's 67 years old. His medical history includes chronic lymphocytic lymphoma that was diagnosed in 2004, and he had been treated for that in 2009. And is, at the time that we met him, it had been in remission. The history of prostate cancer, also treated um, coronary artery disease, diabetes, hypertension. And then he's also had open heart surgery, he's had his prostate removed. Um, he lives with his wife, they've been together 40 plus years. He is a, dis a disabled veteran. He was a smoker, but he quit a long time ago, and no alcohol or drugs. And this is a pretty functional gentleman. He's able to take care of himself, he's very involved with his family. So, we've got to start at the beginning. Now, in February of last year, he was watching a basketball game when he all of a sudden experienced a seizure. This was new for him. So they brought him into the hospital, they consulted the neurology service, and they thought that maybe this was due to a stroke. He had the risk factors for it. So he was worked up there on the neurology service. However, very shortly after admission, he was noted to have an elevated white count and developed a very, very high fever. So this, of course, changed the, the course of his admission. He was transferred to medicine where he was treated for suspected meningitis. He had fluctuating mental status, agitation, which was very upsetting for the family. The imaging looked okay. Um, they wanted to do an LP, and it took several, several uh, tries to finally get one. But when they did, it was consistent with an infectious process. So he was started on antibiotics and antiviral medications for that treatment. Luckily, you know, we got him to where he was doing well enough that he could go home. And, you know, to the patient, the family, that was, that was it. That was the end of it. So things were okay for a while. He followed up with his PCP about a week or so after he left the hospital. And at that time, there was no acute issues. He was fine. He also saw his hematology doctors, because it's been a while since he'd been checked up for his uh, CLO, the leukemia. And they said at that time that he was in partial hematologic remission. So in other words, he's fine, doesn't need any treatment. So from a hospital admission standpoint, from his uh, malignancy standpoint, we're looking good. He also saw the ID doctors uh, in, in March. And at that time, he had completed his course of medications for his uh, meningitis, and they felt no further intervention was warranted. At, towards the end of March, he went and saw his PCP again. And he said, you know, I'm having headaches, but otherwise I'm okay. And there wasn't anything too special about his headaches. And so the recommendations at that time were just lifestyle met, er, changes and things to avoid, and the family and the patient felt comfortable with that, so they went home. By the time he saw his primary care doctor again in May, he was still having these headaches. And in addition to the headaches, they were also starting to notice that he would get this tightness in his hand, like it was raising up towards his head without, without him intending to do so. And that got them worried about when he was having those seizures before. So it was a red flag for the family. So, he was sent to neurology as an outpatient, and they said, okay, let's get an MRI going, and we'll work it up further. 
Unfortunately, he wasn't able to get that MRI. Before that could happen, he ended up coming back to the emergency room, this time with a new fever. It was up to 100.6. And again, elevated white count. But this time it was much higher than before. 66. Normal, greater than 12. So huge, huge jump. Or less than 12 is normal. So he said, you know, he, he was so sick of his admission in February, he did not want to stay. And so he says, I feel fine. I don't know why they brought me in. Let me go. I just want, what, how old is this gentleman? 67. And he, and then if I'm going too fast, if there's something that's not, if there's something that's not clear, please, please, by all means, stop me because I, I, I talk fast. So he's at this point he's wanting to go home, but the admitting team says, you know what, this could be a relapse of his leukemia, and he could have an infection on top of that. And this is a guy who was just admitted a couple months ago for meningitis, so we've got to admit him. So. Much to his disappointment, he got admitted. So hematology saw him, and they said, you know what, we need to start chemotherapy again. Mm -hmm. And that's what they did. And after a couple of days, he was discharged home with close outpatient hematology follow-up. A couple of days later, he came in with another fever of 101.6. And at this point, he's neutropenic because of the chemotherapy. His his absolute neutrophil count is 800. He's anemic. His counts were right there on the border where he was going to need to have um, frequent transfusions. And he was also thrombocytopenic. And I believe it was probably around 50s, 60s. So he was started on cefepime for coverage of neutropenic fever. In the days that follow, as you can see, from the 1st of July all the way through the 17th, he was poked, prodded, they did a thorough infectious workup. And for the most part, everything was negative. They were able, they grew one blood culture, grew gram-negative rods, which grew the Bacteroides fragilis, which IV thought this was maybe uh, due to like translocation. So they switched him to make sure that whatever he was being covered for, that you know covered the Bacteroides. But the thought was there was something else going on but they just couldn't find it. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, with this counts being as low as they were, he was needing constant uh, red blood cells and platelet transfusions almost every couple of days. And then, again, these headaches, these intermittent headaches. Usually, when we're seeing this, you know, we want to do a lumbar puncture, but his platelet counts were so low that at the time, the risk of Getting that lumbar puncture, you know, the, the risk of bleeding was just too much. And they didn't feel at the time that his symptoms were too worrisome. So while he was still in, in this admission, they decided to get a bone marrow biopsy to see just how extensive this leukemia was. And unfortunately, it did, the biopsy showed extensive marrow infiltration. So in other words, his cancer is back and it is bad. So they said, okay, we need to start him on chemotherapy with this new medication, and I'm going to totally botch it, but it, it brute it. Um, by August, he was showing significant failure to thrive, and he just was too weak to eat. He's losing weight. At this point, he's starting to get very fatigued, very somnolent. He's having intermittent episodes of confusion. They, the team speaks with the family and says, you know what, we should get a peg tube place so we can get some nutrition in him. Any questions up to this point? Okay. So all of July he was still, he's still inpatient? Correct. Okay. So as you can see, so that one chunk, this chunk of time right here, this is all the work up and then mm -hmm. halfway through the month is when they realize they need to start treating not mm -hmm. just this unknown infectious process, but also they've got to treat his uh, leukemia. Mm -hmm. did they ever do, did they, they were wanting to get that MRI to figure out why he had headaches. Did they ever do that? So in between being admitted on the 22nd and where we are now, no. They did not do any imaging at head. Okay. So on the 11th of August, he started to have significant emesis and coughing. 
they thought that maybe it was reflex from the, the tube feedings. He also started having increased work of breathing at this time. They felt, they felt, okay, maybe he's aspirated. So he was transferred to the ICU where he was intubated and put on mechanical ventilation. At that time, they got a CT head, and it showed, because his mental status was, was getting worse, and it showed marked hydrocephalus. And so, because this was thought to be the, the cause of his decline, neurosurgery wanted him transferred to their unit so that that way they could put a drain into his brain and, and drain out some of that extra fluid. So by the 12th, they were able to retrieve some of that fluid and they got new blood cultures. And he was positive, he was growing yeast in both his, his CSF fluid and his blood. And this ine inevitably proved to be cryptococcus. So he was started on very, very potent medications, amphotericin B. And despite being treated for the infection, despite you know getting that drain in place and keeping the pressures where they should have been, there was no improvement in his mental status and his ability to follow commands. He was still you know needing the frequent transfusions, and overall just looked very very bleak. So on the fifteenth. He was transferred back to the, the medicine ICU. And another brain imaging scan, the MRI was done just to see because you know he's not waking up, he's not doing better. And it showed that now he had multiple infarctions throughout his brain. So after a couple of days of sitting in the ICU, they decided to call palliative care. And that very day, a family meeting was held. And we discussed everything that had happened so far. And the decision was they were going to continue current medical management, and he was going to remain full code. Following, so the next chunk of time, the 19th through the 25th, he had more transfusions. He had another bone marrow biopsy. He had another lumbar puncture. And then, as you can imagine, every day, pokes and prods and people coming in, and he's on a, on a tube, like pretty much worst case scenario. So the 26th, you know, th at this point, the ICU team is starting to wring their hands thinking, what, what are we going to do? Like, how are we going to fix this guy? How are we going to get him back to a level that the family wants him to be at? So they had another family meeting, again, bringing up all these, all these issues. And the family just, you know, were pretty set. They just were hoping for a miracle. He was going to get better. He's had close calls before where he's been, you know, intubated and he's come through. So they were going to hold on because he's, you know. But this time they thought, you know, with all, everything that has happened, they were going to change his code status to do not resuscitate. So, you know, even though he was on the ventilator, if his heart stopped, they were just going to let him go. <coughs> and it was during this meeting they said, heroic measures like putting him in dialysis or having a trach placed. They didn't want that sort of thing. So. That was where we stood at the end of August. So on the 1st of September, a huge chunk of time has passed, hasn't it? The 1st of September, they got another CT head, just because, again, there was no improvement happening. And this time, they showed that he was having bleeding from where that, that prior infarct had been. And the ventricles, which we already know had been enlarged, and we had a drain in place for it, were again getting bigger. They got an EEG just to see what sort of brainwave activity was going on, and it showed moderate global encephalopathy. So in other words, not much. So neurology comes in and says, you know what, the, there's very, very little chance that we're going to regain any, if at all, function. And so they use the term, you know, persistent vegetative state. This is, this is best case scenario. And so, of course, with, with this information, the ICU team yet once again went to the family, and the family says, no, just continue current medical. <coughs> so any thoughts, questions up to this point? Okay, so we'll get going. So this is where I come in. So I, at the time that, that this patient was here in our hospital, I was on palliative consult. And obviously, you know, he'd been here for several months. So when I, when I came in, 
I, you know, after all this chart review and knowing what's going on, I kind of figured my first encounter was going to be a lot of the same. Like, this is what's happening, but we still want to do everything. And so I kind of dreaded walking into that room. So when I say unintentional family meeting, I went to go check on the patient that day, and I wasn't expecting there to be family at the bedside. Now, the wife was not there, and it was his daughter, who has also been very active in his medical planning. And we had a very good talk about who her father was, the, the type of man he was. She always viewed him as being very active, being a fighter. And when we talked about the best case scenario, if, if we were to get him stable enough where he could, you know, maybe not need um, to be on the ventilator, he'd still need to have a trach. And he would still probably need a fetal food. And he'd probably still need a lot of help where he would never be able to go home. Because who would provide, you know, that care? So best case scenario, we're looking at a long-term care facility. And knowing who her father was, would he want this? Did the family want this for him? And this is kind of the first time that I think we really got a sense of what the family was thinking. And she told me, you know, my mom is, she's going to withdraw care. I know she is, and she's talked about it. But all these doctors keep coming in, and they keep, like, kind of confusing us. Because one will come in and say, well, everything looks good today. Like, you know, everything is stable. But then they'll pull me aside, and they'll say, you know, it's not looking good, and, you know, we've got to talk about, you know, she felt like because they wanted to be gentle with the mom, they were giving her a nice, happier picture, but with the daughter, who was more matter-of-fact, who was pretty savvy with, with science and medicine, they were more honest. And so you have these two conflicting pictures, and even though in her gut the mom was thinking, you know, I don't want to do this to him anymore, she felt that with all that was going on, she had no choice but to keep going and keep doing whatever the doctors told her to do. And so, you know, things like people coming in, all these frequent family meetings, they didn't like it. They did not like the big room of people all staring at them, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? And the things that actually brought her them comfort was things like when the chaplain would come to visit, you know? The chaplain wasn't saying, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? They were there for support. There was a psychology fellow from our service who was going and seeing the, the family daily. And again, there wasn't that pressure there of, you need to pull a plug, you need to pull a plug, or you need to put a train. And just talking it out, and one-on-one, -on -one, not a big group, made, you know, that's what kind of helped them move forward. So then, you know, with, with this conversation, I, I asked them, what, what can we do? What can we do to make this better for you? And so we came up with a plan that from now on, the messages and information sharing would be, you know, be through the attending or through the fellow in the ICU. And that if they wanted a meeting, that they could, they could let us know. Instead of us showing up every day, you know, do you want to talk? Do you want to talk? And... And that actually, it, it worked out. It made everybody feel better. And so, we, you know, with, as a team, we kind of gave them more space. We stuck with more one-on-one -on -one, um, talks, and it went well for, for a while. Unfortunately, the following day was real scary. So he had two code blues calls on the 6th of September. The first one was because he was losing, he, he wasn't able to breathe well, even on the vent. It turns out there was a mucus plug in the in the tube, and so they actually had to remove the tube and put a new one in. And during that time, he didn't lose his pulse, but it was very scary for the family who, I mean, they were there. They saw this. And then, not even a few hours later, another code blue was called on him, because he was hypotensive. His, I forget how low his blood pressure was, but it was low enough that he actually briefly lost his pulse at one point. Now, he was DNR, so they weren't going to shock him, they weren't going to um, do chest compressions, but they gave him a dose of epinephrine, and they started him on, on pressors, and we got his pulse back. And so, this very, very scary event was noted by the family. 
So for the next several days, we stayed the course. And it was actually looking to a certain point that maybe he could go home if we just get him stable enough. And they were actually reconsidering trade. Because maybe, maybe we could do this long-term care facility thing. On the 11th, general surgery was called to do the, the trach, and they said no. It's just with, he's on, he's on pressers. You know, he's not doing well. He's having organ failure. We're not going to touch him. And so that took away that option. So on the 15th of September, the family called us and they said, you know what, enough is enough. And we want to, we just want to make him comfortable. And so on the 16th, the following day, when all the family was gathered, the patient was extubated, and he was placed on a marking drip to keep him comfortable. He stayed in the ICU. We offered to move him to the CLC downstairs or to a private quieter room in like one of the unit, one of the other units. But you know, at this point, the family had spent a lot of time with the ICU team and the nurses and felt comfortable, and they wanted to just stay where they were. So on the 20th of September, Mr. B passed away. So I wanted to use this time just to kind of debrief. So again, as I mentioned, with this case, no one big thing that kind of changed the course of events happened. It was just a lot of different things, kind of your typical patient case. But it just didn't sit right, like with, you know, what was happening with the family. And so, guess what, what did you think? Like, what would you have done different if you could? I guess one, you know, one thing that kind of jumps out of this, it seems like, you know, when his malignancy came back, that, that was probably a, a terminal event. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe, I wonder if, you know, getting a better handle on what the prognosis and expected course was, you know, then, you know, then may have been helpful for both the patient and the family, and also for the rest of the team. Because it's, you know, it seemed like he kind of rapidly developed all the cons you know, complications associated with his malignancy, but it was really just the cancer <coughs> progressing. Right. And, you know, on top, of, on top of the cancer, he had, you know, that prior meningitis, he had this new cryptococcal meningitis that he was on high, high dose um, medications for. His kidneys were shutting down, his blood pressure was being depressed. I mean, literally, just everything was kind of shutting down. And so, they would, would you have called palliative sooner if you were in charge of this patient? I mean, would you, we have started talking about, you know, maybe we shouldn't get a peg. You know, that, to me, that was one of those moments where I'm like, he's not doing so well, and he's He's fading away. Do we want to give him a peg? Like, is that going to fix him? You know, and at this point, and if you look through, you know, the the notes, it's pretty consistent towards the end. The on, the oncologists or hematologists are saying, well, we can't even give him chemotherapy. You know, like at this point, his, he can't maintain his counts. We gave him one dose of chemotherapy, and he's now needing constant transfusions. And so, you know. <coughs> That, that, that's what strikes me, is that, yes, we were consulted about a month before he passed, but at that point I felt, that's still really late, considering. Like, we could have avoided a, a lot of things that were really stressful to the family, but, but you know, didn't. So. Um, I think that what was striking to me mm -hmm. from the situation you described as a, as a provider, we assume that people want to know, and the more information, the better, and that we're not doing our job right if we, you know, withhold the information, or we're not available at all times for the family to discuss, you know, such critical cases. And you know, the fact that they were able to verbalize to you that they wanted to have the power to decide when they wanted to meet and when the providers should come, and you know, bring the assessment and you know, options. I think it's, it's eye-opening because I only assume that they were expecting something from me the moment that I walked in, mm -hmm. and that was information. Mm -hmm. and, and, and for me, in that moment, it was actually really surprising because we do. We go in, we say our hello, oh, how is this going, did you, you know, what do you think about this, 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 and this, and, you know, it, they, sometimes it, it's just too much. They've heard it already five times that day, and each person has said it differently. Like, one person's like, 
oh, this is happening, but, you know, that optimistic twist, and, you know, you have the one person who's very straight to the point, and is like, well, this isn't good. So, you know, we, we don't think, you know, there's so many different people, not just the different teams, but each team has, you know, the, this patient was in the ICU, so they've got an attending, a fellow, medical student, resident, there's four different people, and they're nurses, just on that one team. You got the palliative team, I mean, there's hundreds of us, but, you know, there was also neurologists coming to see him, there was ID folks coming to see him, hematology, um, neurosurgery, just bunches of service, everybody's saying the same, you know, same thing, different ways, and very confusing for the family. Yeah, I think it, part of it, you know, it has to do with the use of language and, mm -hmm. and what means you know, very narrow kind of technical ways that we say, I mean, stable doesn't mean you're doing well at all. It just means you're not changing, actually. But when people hear that word, they think they're, that it's a good thing. And, and like I say, there are probably many other things like that that are, are just, that, you know, the way we use the terms are not the way people use them in common, normal language. So, that creates, I mean, I've had, I've had friends who, it's like, I don't know why I'm swelling up and I can't breathe and I, I can't even move. I mean, the doctor says my heart's fine. And it's like later you find out no, the, the EF is 20% and what the doctor probably said is there's nothing that needs to be done for your heart. It's like, Oftentimes yeah. people come back from cardiologists and yeah. it's, I don't need surgery. That's so I'm fine. No, it's because it's so they bad they can't fix it. Exactly. And, and somehow that message yeah. never got through. Mm -hmm. right. you know? or, or you see renal. Yeah. And so yeah, you can't breathe. And go, oh, your kidneys are doing they're, great. They're doing fine. And it's like, it's like well, that's why. Yeah. 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 So again, wrong. that kind of very like narrow technical way we say things that doesn't convey the big picture that the people don't understand it. Yeah. And I saw the news. Oh, you know, palliative service, you see this case over and over and over. Um, and one that sticks in my mind was the last time I was at university, and it was the same thing where every team focused on their organ of specialty. And so today the kidneys are looking better, but the lungs aren't so good. And tomorrow the gut's not so good, but the kidneys are better, and the lungs are the same. And so, you know, the family takes that, and they're like, what do we do with these bits and pieces of information? And so my question has kind of always been, I see palliative medicine kind of as the, not the decision making service, but we're the translation service and we're the support service and how do I help these teams realize that there needs to be one unified communicator mm -hmm. that all that information goes through and then it gets given by that one person and I've never found a good way to, to orchestrate that yet. And so oftentimes I have families start get frustrated with me just when I come by and say how are you doing? Yep. What questions do you have? Because they think I'm another asking for a decision situation. So I'm sorry. And, no. and that was the thing that we had to do with this family was, you know, from the palliative service, we, we had to restrict who was going to go see them. And so we pretty much at that time, like I said, they were doing really well with our chaplain. So our chaplain continued to visit. And again, in those conversations, they weren't talking about the medicine. They weren't talking about, you know, when are we going to pull the plug? They were providing support and just being there. And the psychology fellow, you know, spoke more about what was actively happening, but again, it wasn't in that pushy, what are you going to do? It was, tell me what you're thinking. I want to know your thought process. And then being able to come back to the team and say, this is where they are, helped to kind of come up with, you know, helped to come up with a plan for everybody. So we, we were able to minimize who was coming in and out to a certain degree. Unfortunately, each each team has to have one representative, and with there being so many teams, you know, there's still a ton of people. But I know the ICU, for their part, really did make an attempt to minimize the information sharing to rounds, only with rounds, or if something something big was happening. And even then, you know, if something big was happening, it was just one person going to update the family and to let them know. So, I guess what what sort of approaches in communicating with, with this family, would you have taken? I know you mentioned you know minimizing, but I think for me, you know, as a primary care doctor, I always go back to, you know, when you said in June he didn't want to come into the hospital, and you know, for me, it's pretty easy, frankly, for me when I go, you know, when I go visit a patient in the ICU because I will have known the patient when they were out in the community, like still volunteering and doing, work. and I'll just be able to look at the family and say, wow, things have really changed, haven't they? And, you know, Joe, really, Mr. V, you know, I know from my conversations with him that, you know, 
this is not how he would want to spend three months of his life, you know. Um, so anyway, I think I, I always try to bring it back to what I know about the patient and what he would have wanted. And like if he could stand by this bedside today and be a part of this conversation, you know, what advice would he give us and what would he want us to do? Because, and again, I agree with you going back to the peg. I mean, you know, there are these certain sort of moments, right, where, you know, you feel like there is an opportunity to direct the care. And, um, I mean, I just, because I just couldn't believe, like, when you, when I was like, wow, he was in the hospital that whole time, you know, and it seems like there are windows of opportunity to talk about, like, what are his goals, what were his goals. Yeah, while he could still say so. While he could intervene, while yeah. he could participate, but yeah. then also when he's in, you know, when he's intubated in the ICU, um, and I mean, gosh, I've been a part of the problem with the whole, like, oh, you know, if we didn't have to um, give him pressors today, so he's doing well, you know, like, there's, it's like saying someone's stable or doing well is like such a loaded and like not reliable way to, you know, it's just, I don't know, you should just never say it. You know, I've, I've kind of learned too that you should just never say that because um, there will be people in the family who want to hang on to any, you know, nugget. any nugget of positive yeah. um, report. Um, so anyway, so I guess what I do is when I find myself going astray, and I've done it a lot, I just try to get all of us back to, well, what do we know about Mr. V and what he would, what he has told us in the past about what he would have wanted. And like you say, um, reminding people like our best case scenario is not that he's walking out of here and able to talk with his grandkids, right? He's going to an LTAC or SNF, um, you know, that can take care of a trait patient. You know? So, um, so anyway, I mean that's, and I don't know, that's one of the benefits of primary care is that if you've known somebody when they were more robust and active, just sort of even seeing me there in the hospital kind of reminds everybody of like, how far things have come, you know. Um. You know, and then when you mentioned, um, you know, before getting the PEG or any other procedure, having that talk about goals of care, I wasn't involved in, in this case from the beginning. So I did a lot of chart reviewing, like literally every single chart, just looking for any nugget of was there a point in this several month hospitalization where somebody stopped and said, should we even be doing this? Like, does he want this? And it wasn't until I would say the here the the eleventh August when he started aspirating and couldn't breathe was when there was documentation that someone had said, "Do you want to be intubated? With everything that's going on, do you want to go? You know, do you, we want we want to make keep him full code." Do we want to do all this? And then, if you think about that situation, th their loved ones are watching <coughs> their family member gasping for air. You know, vitals probably all over the place. Of course they're going to say yes, fix him, do something. He looks uncomfortable. But something I noted in that particular documentation was that the wife, who of course knows him best, and this is the surrogate, his medical power attorney, actually hesitated and thought, I don't know that he'd want this. And they, they documented this. And the, the children who were there at the time, two, two, sons, or two daughters and a son, said, no, we want everything done. Mm -hmm. And so it was kind of a pressuring on, on the family's behalf to, to keep them full code, to go through with the, the intubation. And mind you, at this point, he'd already had the pine tube. So I mean, if you, we could, if there's so many different points in this course where someone could have stopped and said, you know, you know, this medication we're going to start is, you know, can hurt your kidneys. You know, do you want to do this? Do you want to get this? Do you want to be on chemotherapy? And, re and as much as I reviewed the chart, I really never, never saw that pause to reassess what the future was going to look like. I'm sure nobody expected things to turn out the way they did. I mean, this was literally one horrible thing after the next. But as we were going through, you can see those chunks of time where nothing was happening. Those where I would kind of lump days together where, you know, nothing was happening. We were just staying the course and doing what we were doing. So I guess overall, what, what can we take home from this case? What are some things that maybe we'll want to change in our own practice, things that we don't realize we're doing. The other thing I wonder is if some of these yeah. discussions, if it was, 
because sometimes you'll you'll kind of broach it as well. Do you want to have a trach or not have you know not have a trach as opposed to you know that it's kind of like care versus not getting care type of thing. Whereas instead, sometimes if you reframe the question of well you know to improve your breathing, we can use medications to make you comfortable, or we can use some breathing machine, and so that then they feel like there it isn't a choice between you know, doing something for the breathing or watching the person continue to gasp, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing I, I was going to mention is something that I know we see all the time in, in, in these folks who are on life support and the prognosis is very grim. What do you do when the family members are telling you, I don't think this is right. I don't want this to happen to him or her. But I feel too guilty to let, him die. to let him die because I'm killing them. I'm killing them. And so that was the, the thought from the mom. And that's why she kept saying, I need time. I will, I will make the decision that needs to be made, but I need time. Because, for, I mean, this was eating her up. And she, the daughter was saying, she doesn't want to talk to us about it. Like, she just, she wants to deal with it on her own. She wants to make this decision on her own. Like, what do, what do you do to help ease that guilt, to help them feel better to make the, these decisions. Because I know we see it a lot. And that's probably where the chaplain comes in. Because a lot of people, uh, in, I do diabetes, and so I ask people all the time, and a lot of times, you know, are you stressed? Yes, what do you pray? Okay, well, it would be good if you didn't drink sodas while you were praying, but okay. But you know, but a lot of people use that as their coping mechanism. But they still need to decide to take some action. But, um, this, but one reason I'm here, I have three really good friends who all have lung cancer with metastasis to the brain. And so they're saying, well, what do I do? I don't know what to tell them. And so, you know, everybody hopes for that miracle. Everybody hopes that you're going to be that one person that is going to fix and you'll be here for your grandkids. And these are people in their 40s. So it's really kind of scary when, I don't, like, again, I think everybody hopes for a miracle. Mm -hmm. And you it, have to keep doing as much as you can until. And it's a hard position that we're in as, you know, when we're doing palliative care because the last thing we want to do is dash hope. Mm -hmm. We don't want that. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we know that if we continue to encourage that hope for a miracle and not be realistic and you know let them know what the future looks to be holding then we're going to keep being in these positions where we're watching unnecessary suffering and again you know it's exhausting for for the all the the providers but for the family as well and the, the, you know, they're seeing their, their loved ones suffer, and yes, this is what they want. This is what they chose. But it's still taking a toll on them because the result that they want is not coming. And so, you know, how do we deal with this guilt? How do we deal with, with all that? <clears throat> That's what I feel like bringing it back to, you know, what would the patient want? Because I'm, I sort of talk to the families about, like, you know, um, you know, when you're sort of having those initial goals of care discussion, you know, we'll say, well, the whole reason we do this now, and I'll do it like on the first or second time I see somebody, and they're like, what? And I'm like, well, the time to have this talk is now, so that when we come to those tough decisions down the road, your wife or your husband or your daughter can make that tough decision, but just know that they're only doing what you would want them to do. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I, I always try to, if it's the spouse or the, the child, I'll say, well, I don't ever, I don't, in my mind, I don't think about it as they're making a decision to do comfort care or whatever. I'm like, we're just basically trying to do what, you know, Mr. V would have wanted. And so we have to just put our heads together and think about if he could sit here and tell us today what he would want. And, and that way, that maybe alleviates some of that guilt of, you know, um, so I don't know. Sometimes I do think, I don't know, if, um, you know, I, I feel that we put too much decision making on the family mm -hmm. and you know are asking them to tell us to withdraw care on their you know spouse of 60 years and you know I don't know I mean that's a, a tough thing and so I try to always bring it back to really what we're doing is just what you know helping to honor what he would have wanted and let him in his life how he would have wanted. So my big lesson for the day um, because it's, it's hit me in the face now twice today already it's only one o'clock um, is the whole idea of lobbing the question back to the, to the family. You know, what do you see going on? And I think a lot of the time, and I know I'm guilty of this, I don't really reinforce the concept of limitations in physiology. You know, we're all about what medicine can do, but there are limitations in what 
physiology of a patient can tolerate. And so what I have started trying to do is saying, you know, what do you see his body telling us? I've got a patient right now who's um, wanting to get a transplant, but he's too debilitated and all these other things. And it's like he feels like he's failing because he hasn't been able to will his mind mm -hmm. to do physical therapy. And it's like, but what is your body telling you? He's like, I just want to lay here. And it's like, well, we need to honor that. And I think, you know, his, this poor man's body was communicating very early on. And somehow or another, we put too much faith in medicine. So was that going back to the old days in the 70s when they had ethics boards? So that they made the decision, not you. It's hard when you know the patient to make those decisions. But somebody else tells you, no, we're not going to go forward with that, or no, they're not going to do it, or no, we're not going to it's easier to pass off to... And that's where maternalism in this starts to come in. It's not, it's not paternalistic. We don't tell you what you have to do, but we kind of nudge you in the right, right. direction of you know, honoring what the patient has told us they want. We're kind of removing the, you know, not, not all the responsibility, but exactly. just kind of like if a, a person, a trusted person in authority mm -hmm. kind of helps you, you know, say, you know, this is what, you know, while that sounds like what he would have decided, and, and mm -hmm. you know, it, it, I think it does help. Yeah. Oh. And then, of course, there was no that no one person who was in authority in this particular case. There, which, and there yeah. wasn't. You know, the, the, the wife wanted to make the right decision, and she wanted to do I mean, what was right for her husband, but, you know, with the kids, and it kind of switched, actually, like later on in, the, in his care. Mm -hmm where this, the children were seeing their father like this, and of course, you know, tubes and wires and the whole nine yards, and and they're thinking, okay, we can't do this anymore. You know, mom can't take care of him if he does come home, and it's going to break her heart for him to be, you know, in a long-term care. And will he even be in there at this point? Because we're seeing these images of his brain and the EEG, and it's, it's not working, you know? And what, is he even there? We're, but in, by the end, the mom was like, I, well, you know, we've come this far. We've done all this. I can't let him go now. So, so just some take-home points for me. The earlier palliative care involvement is key. And I don't necessarily mean consulting the team. I mean talking about goals of care. And I think, you know, it's our job to work not just, you know, amongst ourselves, but with our other um, colleagues in different disciplines, letting them know that, just because you can't do something doesn't mean you should. And talking about what what's the end goal? What what, is, what are the, does the patient and the family really want? And before we do the things we do, and that there is no cookie cutter recipe for communicating with families. You know, I, I know a lot of us we have our spiel ready to go when we walk into the room, and some families just don't respond to the usual, you know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so, kind of getting a sense of what the family is going to be responsive to, what how, what and how they want to receive information is, is really important if you want to keep the lines of communication open. Because for us, initially, we actually had the door shut on us. The, when, the, when they were first consulted, it was very like, well, we're going to keep doing everything. So, we'll call you if we need you. So. It was, you know, the, the chaplain and our, and our psychology fellow who kept that communication open, making it easier for us to get involved when it was closer to the end. So that brings me to my last point, that this interdisciplinary cooperation is necessary in patient care. Because, you know, you may know the science, you may know the medicine behind it, but if you don't have that rapport with the patient's families, you're not going to get anywhere with it. So, any, any questions? I have a question. Oh, of course. Uh, what the family feels when the patient passed away? I was going to ask that very all, same thing. Yes. All these process. <laughs> if you show them this uh, process, what the family is going to feel? I think if they were to look, to really take a step back, I think they would actually, it doesn't make them sad. It, mm -hmm. it makes me sad to look at this. And I think, and that, this is not my loved one. You know, this is my patient. But to look, if this were my loved one and I saw what all they'd gone through, I mean, it would break my heart. Towards the end of his care, you know, they, they requested we come back. They requested that he be made comfortable. And so towards the end, we, we stopped pushing. Because the, the, the mom had said, I, I, I'm going to come to that conclusion. I am. Just 
let me do it. And we did. We let her, and, and that's what she did. And so, but yeah, I, I, I agree. My, my point, I, I'm not a physician. I, mm -hmm. I don't go into this situation, but I'm the ad, you know, I'm the user of mm -hmm. the system. My, my personal experience, when I send a person, you know, I put my relatives in hospital, I really don't know whom to communicate. Mm -hmm. Okay, everybody, I don't know who communicate. You know, everybody comes in, tell you a few words. My experience with my father-in-law, he got a stroke. We sent him to the hospital for two days. Then finally, one nurse come. Nobody talked to us. Then finally, the nurse comes in and say, he's going to die. How come you didn't ever gather your family member here? I say, nobody tell, nobody tell us he's going to die <laughs> You know, in, in a minute or two. So they assume we know he is going to die, but we don't know, you know, how do I know? <laughs> so I think this, that's one system. Another thing is, uh, if, you, if you can get this family back to go through this, they may give you some suggestion how to improve the care. So maybe, I don't know, you know, I, I just feel, you know, so I know we are guessing everything, what to do. But for me, when I look at it, my personal experience seems it's a natural course to go through this. I would probably do the same thing with the end. Okay. Right. There's probably like a lack of like before, kind of throughout, throughout, and it just became more and more providers, and like none of the providers we're really in a position at that point to build a rapport with the family because they're here for the brain, they're here for the pig tube, they're here for the whatever else. And that's you know, probably where you're suggesting to kind of go back in time and find somebody that already has a rapport with the family or the patient would be a, mm -hmm. a good strategy. I almost feel like all the care is directed to the patient, but none of the care is directed to the family mm -hmm. indirectly. And they're in it from a you know emotional standpoint. And they're hurting from that standpoint. Not the physical side, but the emotional side. And they're probably just like not taking into consideration as much. Mm -hmm. No, it's hard. I mean, I'm, I'm speaking from being on the outside and having gone through this with my mother. Mm -hmm. I was very fortunate that I had. She had you know two doctors that when that time came, you know they would guide me in that direction. So that when it came, I was ready to make that decision. And as I said, I was fortunate in that respect.